Well, the last three Sundays, we've been talking about the dangers of idolatry. The dangers that come to believers from idolatry. Idolatry comes from taking our eyes off of God. That's how simply, how easily, and how dangerously we can fall into idolatry. Taking our eyes off of God. Worshiping anything in place of God. Having our hearts cling to anything else, anyone else, for ultimate security. We saw from Psalm 115 that one of the dangers and consequences of idolatry is that you actually become like what you worship. You become like idols. Eyes, but you don't see. Ears, but you don't hear. And then Jesus picks that up and says, you have hearts that have no understanding. You become like what you worship. Idolatry results in belittling the glory and the holiness of God. The God who says in Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. We also talked about how idolatry directs our awe away from God. We're not in awe of Him, but we're in awe of whatever it is we, we worship. And then we think, turn around and think that God is not enough. That's idolatry. And one of the ways that idolatry so often reveals ourselves is, is in our grumbling toward God. And if we're grumbling, we're not grateful. And if we're not grateful, we're not worshiping God. And if we're not worshiping God, Romans 1 says, that's idolatry. So last week, we started talking about, okay, so how do we deal with idolatry in our hearts? How do we deal with it? Well, believers are to battle idolatry. We're to battle the temptation to take our eyes off of God by fixing our eyes on Christ the author and perfecter of our faith. We're to rejoice in the Lord. We're to delight ourselves in Him. We're to rejoice in salvation. Ask God, plead with God, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. So we continue this morning with that question. How do God's children deal with temptations of idolatry? How do believers battle idolatry in our hearts? How do followers of Christ live lives of pleasing worship rather than live in idolatry? The simple answer is that believers are to battle idolatry through communion. Now, the, the heading, if, if we have a heading uh, today, is gonna, it says prayer. Um, but ultimately, believers are to battle idolatry through communion communion that prayer is communion with god what is communion it's it's the word that uh the puritans and and throughout history that they, they interchange with fellowship right communion is a joint participation right it is uh having a, a fellowship with god in christ right first john one tells us that we have fellowship with god first corinthians one tells us we have fellowship with christ Right? We have fellowship and we are to uh, pursue fellowship with God in Christ, abide in Christ, live in Christ. All right? We have union uh, with Christ and we're supposed to pursue that. So this morning, we're, we're going to focus on the singular aspect of prayer as our weapon against idolatry. We're going to focus on prayer as how we battle against idolatry. So we've, uh, Jesus read for us Matthew uh, chapter 6, the, what we've uh, typically referred to as the Lord's Prayer. I just want to point out that when you look at the context of that, Jesus provides this prayer as a response to those hypocrites, those who pray, and those who do anything, really, because they love to be seen by others. They love uh, just this man-centeredness, the man's approval as a response to man-centered idolatry. So this morning, in response to, in a fight with, at war against idolatry in our hearts, we're going to take a look at what Jesus instructed us in terms of prayer. Now, I'm not going to exposit this as I would strictly going through this passage, but uh, just to show us what Jesus is teaching us in terms of setting our eyes on God, 
as we battle against idolatry. First of all, I want us to see that number one, prayer is worship. Number one, prayer is worship. And if you're not worshiping gods, guys, you are worshiping idols. Prayer is worship. Look at uh, Matthew 6, verse 9 uh, again. It says, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Guys, prayer is worship. We pray, we worship. Worship is a right response to God. It states the truth about God. First and foremost, about his identity, his holiness, his glory, which is wrapped up in his name. That's why, again, Isaiah 42, 8 is so important. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Based on the first of the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no uh, uh, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, you shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. Guys, our prayer doesn't necessarily uh, have to follow a formula, right? Not all of your prayers doesn't have to be this prayer, word for word. But what, what Jesus teaches us through this prayer, what undergirds our understanding, what, what is at the foundation of prayer and of our worship is that God is your heavenly Father and his name is holy. Hallowed be your name. As that is essentially saying, may your name be treated as holy. Guys, and if you're praying that, God, may your name be treated as holy. You're saying, may it be that I would treat your name as holy. May it be that I would treat you as holy. Guys, and you can't do that. Notice, you can't say, God, may it be that I would treat you as holy as you are. And then turn around with and have eyes fixed on idols. You can't do that. You can't pray that prayer at the same time harboring anger in your heart. You can't do that while lusting in your heart. You can't treat God's name as holy and at the same time grumble toward God. You can't. That's why prayer is your weapon against idolatry. You battle idolatry. You fight against sin through communion, through worship, through this deep fellowship, through prayer, through your heart, submitting to God as holy. Hallowed be your name. It is the same word that we use uh, for holy, hagiadzo, right? Uh, uh, to set apart, consecrated, treated as sacred. To be treated knowing there is no one like him. No one like him. Certainly no idol is like you. All right, so today's uh, outline, by the way, is uh, C and down, right? Letter C and below. Everything else is review from last week. Okay, all right. What we're saying when we pray that, we're saying, as, as Isaiah 42 would say, we would say, Lord, you our God. You are the Lord. That is your name. Your glory you give to no other. Your praise to carved idols. Guys, I, uh, the first sermon was essentially based on Psalm 115, right? That you become like what you worship. You become like the idols you make and trust. The beginning of that psalm says, as Chris Tomlin famously saying, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name. Give glory. Guys, he is to be treated as such. That is to be our prayer. Not to me, oh Lord, not to me, but to your name be glory. Number one, prayer is worship. And if you're worshiping God, treating God as holy, treating his name as holy, you're not worshiping idols because worshiping God is incompatible with idols. Number one, prayer is worship. Number two, Matthew 6.10, prayer is submission. Number two, prayer is submission. And if you're submitting to God, you're not submitting to idols. Matthew 6, verse 10. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. 
on earth as it is in heaven. I'm going to reference again Psalm 115. It's a very important chapter. It tells us now in verse 3, Psalm 115, verse 3, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that He pleases. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that He pleases. Last week, we talked about joy. Right? You want joy in this life? It only comes one way. Only one. True Everlasting joy only comes in submission to the fact that our God is in the heavens. He reigns, he rules, and he does all that he pleases. If you want joy in this life, that's the only way. As we sing in, in the hymn, Blessed Assurance, perfect submission, perfect delight. If you don't have perfect delight in this lifetime, okay, you need to visit that first phrase. Perfect submission to God. Guys, when it comes to idolatry, when you are tempted to cling to something other than God for security, for comfort, when you're tempted to follow after your earthly desires, to live by your pre-Christ sinful ways, to seek and to find joy in your old self, to follow, as uh, do you recall Numbers 15, to follow your own heart, and your own eyes, God says, which you are inclined to whore after. In Numbers 15, 39, God says that you, when you follow your own heart, your own eyes, you're inclined to be unfaithful to him, to have an affair with the things of the world. Guys, when you're tempted to doubt God's goodness because idolatry says in your heart, hey, hey, you got to go find security elsewhere. God's, God, because God's clearly not going to provide that. When you doubt God's goodness, or you're tempted to, because idolatry says in your heart, hey, you know, you're going to have to go find comfort somewhere in this world. Because, you know, clearly circumstances aren't going well. You need to take matters into your own hands. That's idolatry. You must battle idolatry. You must worship God. You must have communion with Him. You must pray in submission. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You guys want to talk about course correction for your hearts? Your will be done. You want to talk about conformity to Christ? Your kingdom come, your will be done. Guys, are, are you wanting to grow in humility? Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Are you struggling with and wanting to grow in patience? Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Are you struggling with and wanting to grow in contentment? Your kingdom come. Your will be done. You are su to submit to the Lord. Why? Many reasons. I'll just limit myself to two right now. Two reasons why you're to submit to the Lord. Number one is because anything short of submission to God is saying, my kingdom come, my will be done. That's called idolatry. Anything short of utter submission to God is saying, my kingdom come, my will be done. And that is idolatry. This is why we need to submit to the Lord. Number two, because his wisdom is infinite and ours is infinitesimal. Why are you to submit to the Lord? Because His wisdom is infinite. Ours, I don't even know if you can call it microscopic. Okay, a bunch of you guys probably took calculus. Okay, our wisdom approaches zero, okay, compared to the Lord. You are to submit to the Lord. Why? Well, look at what the Bible says. His word is perfect, Psalm 19. It revives the soul. Our hearts are wayward. Our soul is distracted. His precepts are right, rejoicing the heart, whereas our hearts are too much like the world, tainted, devoid of true joy. His commandment is pure, enlightening the eyes, whereas we turn the corner and we expose our eyes to the filth of this world. You are to submit to the Lord. It is in the word Lord, master, sovereign ruler, 
even owner. That's what we're saying when we call him Lord. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Guys, whose, whose kingdom are we talking about right now? Not a trick question. God's. Is his kingdom coming? That's not a hard one. Yes. Will his will be done? Yes. Okay. Well, since that's the case, since you exist in God's universe, and this is God's kingdom coming, and this is God's will that will be done, guys, whose side do you want to be on? Whose will do you want done? God's? Or some idols? As we, we, we live in a world that has it all backwards. When uh, John MacArthur preached on the Lord's Prayer, he, he talks about this, how everything's backwards. He says, you know, uh, how we get it backwards is it's not about what you want, God. It's, it's about what I want. I don't exist to serve you. No, no, no. You exist to serve me. It's backwards. That's why we struggle so much, because we get this backwards. He went on to say that that is a form of blatant idolatry. That's the kind of blasphemy that violates the first commandment to have no other gods. MacArthur even pointed out that in paganism, guys, in, in pagan religions, even they don't go around thinking that these gods that they serve exist to serve them. They, they, even they, pagans, recognize that they're at the mercy of these gods. And yet, for some reason, when Christians get Christianity wrong, we might concede that, okay, yeah, it's God's kingdom, but my will be done. I might admit to and acknowledge it's God's kingdom come, yet I want my will to be done. Lord, have mercy on our souls. Forgive us for all of our idolatry based on, on your mercy through Jesus. We are to submit to the Lord. Guys, prayer is submission to God. And if you're submitting to God, you're not submitting to idols. Submission to God is incompatible with idols. So number one, prayer is worship. Number two, prayer is submission. And number three, prayer is trusting God. Prayer is trusting God. And if you're trusting God, you're not trusting in idols. Matthew 6, verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. We are to trust God. We are to trust that God is enough. Not just that his grace is enough to save you, but that his grace is enough to sustain you. Guys, we actually get grace wrong if we think and we limit grace to simply the beginning of salvation. Right? That, that grace is only God's part. And no, it's his power. It's his provision. Give us this day our daily bread. He provides you what you need. Daily bread reminds us of the manna that God provided his people. I'm going to pause and do an Old Testament bit here. This is why we need to read the Old Testament. And this is why our children's ministry curriculum is based on that. Teaching the Old Testament so by the time they grow up and listen to the New Testament, and we talk about daily bread and talk about manna, they know. And we know. What was manna for the people of Israel? It was daily bread. It, was, it would be enough just for that day. And if they tried to collect more, what happened to it? Spoiled. Went bad. And worse than having manna spoil and go bad, you know what that was? People trying to gather up more than God provided? It actually revealed their lack of faith. It actually revealed their lack of trust in God. I'm going to say right now, living today in 2024 with our salaries, our savings, our meals all planned out, I'm going to say this, that actually hinders our understanding of Matthew 6.11. It actually threatens and, and gets in the way of our application of this prayer. Psalm 68, uh, 19 says, Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. He daily bears us up. 
But the problem is we read Matthew 6, 11 today and we need a, uh, to read that with a warning. And here's the warning. Brothers and sisters, beware of your ability to do, uh, war, you know, to, to do your work, to do well in the field that God has placed you in. We're to be grateful for it. We're to work as unto the Lord. But beware of mistaking that God-given form of sustenance with, oh, Matthew 6, 11, I don't need to pray this prayer. I don't need to ask God to give us this day our daily bread. I don't need to ask God to provide for me this day that which I need. You know why? Because I got a steady income. I got pretty good savings too. Beware the idolatry of self. Beware the idolatry of self-sufficiency, self-worship. We cannot make the mistake of thinking we do not need to trust and depend on God daily through prayer. Also, let me add kind of on the other uh, end of the spectrum when it comes to this prayer. Uh, somebody, just to pra paraphrase someone, Guys, as a reminder, this prayer, give us this day our daily bread, is a prayer for our daily physical needs, not our sinful greed. Okay? This is not a prayer for, for give me what my sinful heart desires. No, it's, our, it's a prayer for our daily physical needs, not our sinful greed. Brothers and sisters, we battle idolatry in our hearts through wholehearted devotion, Right, we fight against lurking idols through worship and communion. We resist the temptation of idolatry through our trust in God, that God is enough, that God is the one who provides. So let me let me just say it, uh, just in, in one other way, guys. There is a difference between being prepared, stewarding our resources responsibly, yet truly trusting that our times are in God's hands. There's a difference between that and idolatrous, sinful anxiety. Thinking God is not enough. Thinking that God is not the one who provides me what I need daily. Sinfully mistrusting God and not trusting in his daily provisions. Guys, that's, that's not submission. That's not trust. That's us going somewhere else for comfort and security. That's idolatry. But on the other hand, worship. Worship is a submissive posture of trust before God. Worship is a submissive posture of trust before God. And guess what, guys? God knows the difference. When he looks at us, he knows the difference between idolatry and worship. Between idolatry, which is not trusting in him, which is unacceptable, which is actually an, an abomination versus worship that is prayerful, deep communion with God and fellowship with him, submission and trust. And being anxious too. Guys, what did Jesus say in this very chapter, Matthew 6? He says, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Matthew 6, 31. For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you, uh, that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God. Not idols. Seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Prayer is trusting God. And if you're not trusting God, we're doing the opposite. We're trusting idols. But trusting God is incompatible with idols. So prayer, remember, is worship. Number two, it is submission to God. Number three, it is trust that God provides. Number four, prayer is alignment to God's forgiving character. Prayer is alignment 
to God's forgiving character. Guys, and if you are aligned to God's forgiving character, you're not aligned with idols. Let's read verse 12 again. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Look down at verse 14 and 15. That's technically not a part of the prayer, but Jesus adds that for us to understand the extent and gravity of forgiveness. Look at verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And here's the warning in verse 15. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now we need to, we need to flesh that out a little bit. Remember, idolatry is what? It's taking your eyes off of God. It's worshiping anything in the place of God. It's when your heart clings to anything assigned for Him for ultimate security. But what I'm going to say is that idolatry can actually show itself, not can, it does show itself in an unforgiving heart. Idolatry reveals itself in an unforgiving heart. Guys, the Greek word for forgive is this word, aphiemi. It means to release. That word means to release. An unforgiving heart does not release. An unforgiving heart does the opposite. It clings to some perceived right to hold something against another, to hold something over the head of some something uh, over the head of someone someone did wrong. And so that the temptation, the idol, the altar at which you end up worshiping when you have an unforgiving heart is the idol of your own fist clenched around something done to you. And you don't release. You hold on to that. That's your God. That's what you worship. Uh, let, me, let me go straight to it. Guys, when you're not forgiving, you're not worshiping God. When you are not forgiving, you cannot worship God. You might think you're offering God worship. You might think that words coming out of your mouth is a pleasing aroma to God, but it is not acceptable to God. Let me show you where I'm getting that from the Bible. It's actually the fourth G of our peacemaker pledge, go and be reconciled. In Matthew 5, 23, you can turn there if you like. In Matthew 5, verses 23 and 24, Jesus says, So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave. Leave the altar. Uh, I'm sorry, leave the gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Loved ones, if you want to worship rightly and not live idolatrously, you must seek forgiveness. Jesus said, leave your gift and go. He's not being figurative. Leave the altar of worship. Get up and leave service. Get up and leave. Our Lord's not kidding around. Get up and go. First, be reconciled. Don't try to come and, and lift up praise that God doesn't accept. No, go. Get out of here and go be reconciled. Then come back to the altar and offer your gift of worship to God. And then he will accept it. If you want to worship rightly and not live idolatrously, you must be aligned to God's forgiving character. You must seek forgiveness. You must extend forgiveness. Matthew 6, 12, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. It goes both ways. Colossians 3, 13, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. I want to make this as clear as possible. Sitting here in a worship service doesn't necessarily mean you're worshiping. That's why we have time and intentionally made time in our worship service for prayer of confession. Uh, 
uh, there's no uh, illustration needed or metaphor needed. You just have to preach what Jesus says. Matthew 18. Jesus said that therefore the, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one of them was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. 10,000. You don't need to know the conversion rate. It's just unpayable. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay everything. And out of pity, out of pity for him, the master said of that, uh, of that servant, released him and forgave him the debt. He released him and forgave him that debt. But when that same servant went out and found a fellow servant who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. But that servant, he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay that debt. When his fellow servant saw what had taken place, and they were very greatly distressed, they went and reported that to their master all that, 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 that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant. You wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. I forgave you a debt that was unpayable, insurmountable, because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. That was indefinite. Guys, that was not a payable debt. So also, Jesus says, my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Psalm 115, 8 says that you become like what you worship. You become like the idols you make and trust. You become like them. You have eyes, but you can't see. You have ears, but you can't hear. And Jesus says, you have a heart that's dull and not understanding. If and when you have an unforgiving heart, you become like the idol that you worship. You become like the idol of unforgiveness. You become like what you worship. How? How do you become like that idol of unforgiveness? Well, if you have a heart characterized by unforgiveness, you will have a heart that's not understanding grace. I don't care if you can write me a paragraph on the definition of grace. You don't truly understand grace. You don't understand you've received it. You don't know how to give it. You don't know grace. I don't care if you know the word in Greek. You don't know the word grace. That's why Jesus says, for if you forgive others your trespasses, your heavenly Father will for also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your tras trespasses. Guys, if you uh, refuse to forgive someone, it reveals the true state of your heart. Whether or not you profess with your vocal cords that you believe in Christ, if you refuse to forgive somebody, it reveals the true state of your heart. Unforgiven. That's what Jesus is saying. And you can't mess with that. You might have grown up in the church. You might have read the Bible a lot of times. But if you don't forgive, Jesus is saying, you're in a state of unforgiveness. It goes both ways. You're not forgiving, and guess what? It shows that you are not truly forgiven. 
when you have a conflict with someone, and you have an issue with somebody, and you harbor a grudge in your heart and bitterness, let me ask you this question. Let me put it this way. How is your prayer life? As you harbor resentment and bitterness towards somebody, how is your prayer life? How is your heart's disposition? What is your posture toward forgiveness like? Both the forgiveness from God in Christ and the outflow of forgiveness to others. As you simply cannot have a robust prayer life. You cannot have a walk with God that's truly aligned with God's holy character, his grace, his forgiveness, if you do not have a heart posture of forgiveness, a heart ready and willing to forgive, a heart that's ready and willing to forgive reveals itself as the heart of somebody who understands grace and takes joy in the forgiveness and salvation of that person. It reveals that you understand when you have a forgiving heart posture, it, it reveals that you understand uh, what one preacher said, is that, that God paid a debt that he did not owe because I owed a debt I could not pay. A forgiving heart says that you understand that Christ paid a debt that he did not owe because I owed a debt that I could not pay. Brothers and sisters, you must fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Your heart must be humbled before God. It must be submissive to his will. That's how the believer battles idolatry, through communion, deep fellowship, through worship, praying, and through alignment with his forgiveness, alignment with his grace and his character. But idolatry, the idolatry of forgiveness is when you put yourself in the place of God. That's why it's idolatry. If you have an unforgiving heart, you put yourself in the place of God and you go around concluding, this person does not deserve my forgiveness. So I refuse to give it. That's idolatry. On the other hand, the true child of God fights against idolatrous unforgiveness by acknowledging that you yourself are undeserving of God's forgiveness. But you remember from Colossians 2 that you were dead in your trespasses. You yourself were dead in your trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh and God made you alive together with Christ having forgiven you all your trespasses. How? How? by canceling the record of debt that stood against you, having forgiven you with its legal demands, which he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Colossians 2.13 and 14 says, and instead of clenching your fist around something someone did wrong, you open your hand and cast your praise upon the gracious living God. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in that on a cross, my burdens gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Prayer is alignment to God's forgiving character. And if you're aligned with God's forgiving character, you're not aligned with idols. Those things are incompatible. The believer battles idolatry through communion with God, fellowship with Christ, through prayer. Because prayer is worship. Prayer is submission to Him, His kingdom, His will. Prayer is trust that he's the one who provides prayer. Number four is alignment to God, his character. And number five, prayer is dependence on God. Prayer is dependence on God. And if you're depending on God, you're not depending on idols. 
verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So the word dependence is synonymous with trust, but I just, using this word, I'm going to distinguish it in describing Matthew 6.13 and its petition for prayer. It could have been simply prayer is a, a petition for prayer even. Prayer means we seek protection from God. It means we depend exclusively on God. Guys, that word exclusively needs to be in our vocabulary, not that you have to say it, but in your hearts. Especially if you're tempted to say, oh God, yeah, I, I worship you and this thing over here. No, 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 exclusively. I trust in you, God, you know, like Thursday through Sunday. The other days, I, I trust in myself. No, no, it's exclusive. Right? We, we are to seek protection from our Heavenly Father. Not from your Arlo or your ring devices or your weapons or your big muscles. Not that you can't have those things, but that's not your ultimate protection. Your ultimate protection comes from God. Lead us not into temptation. Keep us from evil. Protect us. We depend on God alone to protect us. You battle idolatry through communion with God. You fight idols in your heart through fellowship with Him, worshiping Him. And you seek protection from God. The alternative to that, the consequence of that, the danger of that is you fall into the idolatry of, of fear. I think we, th th there's more of a presence of the idolatry of fear in our hearts than I think that we're ready to admit. But we, we are to resist that by seeking protection from God, depending on God to resist the evil and temptation remembering something very important when it comes to evil and temptation, guys. You need to remember that God is never the source of your temptation. God alone is your strength against temptation. Okay, guys, guys, God is never the source of your temptation. God alone is your strength against temptation. And I'm going to show you that in, just, in two verses. Sorry, I lied. Three verses. God is never the source of your temptation. James 1 says, in verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. So whenever you're tempted to think, oh, God is tempting me. No, you're wrong. The Bible says you're wrong. God is never the source of temptation to sin. God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. So if you think that, you're wrong and you need to correct your heart with the scriptures. James 1.14, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Don't blame shift. It's nobody else's fault. Your sin, your desire is all yours. Then desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. God is never the source of your temptation God alone is your strength against temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 teaches us that. God alone is your strength against temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, what does God do? He will provide also the, the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. That's an idolatry passage. Flee from it. So if God is faithful and he won't let you be tempted beyond your ability, and he always provides a way of escape, what that means is, guys, you never have an excuse for sin. He told Cain, Sin is crouching at your door and its desire is to control you, but you must master it. That's the Old Testament version. The New Testament version, he provides a way of escape. God is faithful and you can endure it. 
God is never the source of your temptation. God alone is the strength, your strength against temptation. He provides you that escape. He equips you with every weapon against temptation. Where do we see that? Many places, but I'll limit myself just to Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We might be familiar with this passage. Ephesians 6.10 and 11, put on the whole armor of God. Do that. That's an imperative. It's a command. I'm not saying do this, but there was a brother I, I heard a long time ago. He would wake up in the morning and he would put on the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, <laughs> the shield of the faith. Uh, you know, good for him. He started his day intentionally, ready to battle temptation. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Every accusation, every attempt at discouraging you, causing you to doubt, you need to pick up the shield of faith. The belt of truth the gospel of peace, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times. That's the believer's weapon against idolatry. Prayer is dependence on God. It's seeking protection from God. And I'll say it again, anything short of utter dependence on God for protection is idolatry. Anything short of utter and exclusive dependence on God for protection is idolatry. You're going somewhere else for security. You go somewhere else for your comfort. Most likely it's yourself because it's whatever your idols are, those are your own desires. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And if it's not clear brothers and sisters, that we live in an evil day, turn on the news. When people applaud attempted murder. People rejoice in murder. That's the kind of world we live in today. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know, Satan would love to get into a room with you all by yourself. Uh, theologically, that's not possible. See, the problem is if you're truly saved, you're never actually alone. Okay? You don't need to be scared of demons. I was scared of demons as a kid. That's because I didn't understand the Bible. I didn't understand truth. It's the problem with those youth retreats. All we did was talk about demons and demon possession. All we did share stories of uncorroborated story, you know, events. A demon, try as it might to get you one-on-one, -on -one, or the evil one, if it were to try to bash in the door of your heart, who's in his way? It's one of those questions where just asking the question, you already know the answer. Guys, it's not a master lock doorknob that stops the evil one. It's not a schlage deadbolt that he can't pick. It's not some standing lock that gets in his way. It's the spirit of the living God who indwells you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. So pray for protection. Depend on him. Otherwise, you fall into the temptation of self-worship, self-sufficiency, otherwise known as spiritual pride otherwise known as idolatry. Uh, prayer is dependence on God. If you're depending on God for protection, you're not depending on idols. You see, dependence on God is incompatible with idols. Guys, do you see what our Lord was doing when he's teaching his disciples to pray, when he's teaching all his followers to pray? Jesus was teaching us that prayer is worship. So brothers and sisters, 
worship him, not idols. He was teaching us that prayer is submission. So submit to him, his kingdom, his will, not idols. He was teaching us that prayer is trust. So trust in him for your needs, not idols. Jesus was teaching us that prayer is alignment to him, his character. So be conformed to Christ. Don't be more and more like what you worship in terms of idols. Prayer is dependence, so depend on him for protection from evil. Depend on him exclusively, not on idols. As Christopher Wright says, he, you know, the, the, the one lesson we, for some reason, fail to learn is that idols never fail to fail. Idols never fail to fail. As in other words, Jesus, when he was teaching his disciples to pray, when he was teaching his followers to pray, he was teaching us to love our Heavenly Father, not love the world. He was teaching us to love God, our Creator, and rest in Him, in His sufficient grace. He was teaching us to love the Lord and, and not be in awe of idols. Right, we sang it earlier. The, thing, the vain things that, that charm us most. He's teaching us to be in awe of him, not of idols. Guys, Jesus was teaching us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul. So the question, to whom do you devote your worship? Your prayer your submission, your trust. Whom do you love most? Whom do you trust? Steve Lawson, in, in his Steve Lawson ways, I mean, if you've, if you've heard him preach, he put it this way. He said, if you love you more than you love Jesus Christ, you're not a Christian. If you love you, more than you love Jesus Christ, you're not a Christian. I don't care how much you love the church, the people at the church, I don't care how much you love attending events, you must love Jesus, number one, he said. And that's a threat to self. And what does self-love look like? This is a Steve Lawson quote, so hang tight. It's self-centeredness, self-preoccupation, self Pampering, self-indulgence, self-pity, self-promotion, self-pleasures, self-esteem, self-exaltation. It's all got to die, he said. Self-love is being self-consumed, self-absorbed, self-focused, self-fixed. The conversation always has to be about you. You have an obsession with you. But he challenges us saying, you need a better love than you. You need a better focus than you brothers and sisters, and the idolatry of self, the idolatry of this world. You must, going back to what we talked about last week, you must seek and find joy in the right place, and it has to be in God himself, in the joy of his salvation. You want to fight against idolatry? And guys, we are in a fight every day of our lives until he comes and takes us home. Make no mistake about it. To do that, you must worship rightly. You must pray rightly to battle idolatry successfully. And keep in mind that this kind of a prayer, when our eyes are fixed on God, when we seek Him and trust in Him, depend on Him, submit to Him, that's the kind of prayer that glorifies God. Again, John Piper, as we talked about last week, God is most glorified in that. He's most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in Him. When your prayer is all about God and His holiness. Lord, that, that I would treat you, that I would treat your name as holy. 
that you would anticipate his kingdom come, that you would submit to his will be done. When you find your satisfaction in God himself, he is most glorified. He does address, uh, address the objection that John Piper does in his writings, uh, in his messages, that that's not a selfish prayer. When you find all of your joy and all of your pleasure in who God is, in him, that's not actually selfish. That is actually for God's glory. It actually directs others to God and his glory. It's ultimately not selfish. And he points out, you know what a selfish, idolatrous prayer looks like? You just not, all you have to do is, is look at the James chapter 4, verse 3. It's when you ask wrongly to spend it on your own desires, lusts, passions. That's selfish and idolatrous. James 4.4, 4, he goes on and says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? When those are your desires, when your desires are of the world, of these idols, could be things, could be celebrities, could be certain lifestyles, that's, that's idolatry. When we ask for these things and we want to spend it on our own lusts and passions, and desires. That's a selfish, idolatrous prayer. James says, therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. But on the other hand, when you seek and find your ultimate security in God, when you look for your satisfaction in this life in Christ alone and your joy in him, God is most glorified. And if we're not at, at the least examining our hearts before God, if you wake up in the morning and there's just a heap of misery, I need you to examine your hearts are you living in a way that's completely contrary for, to God's literal purpose for your existence? Isaiah 43 says, which is for his glory. Because when we're not doing that, yeah, our life is miserable. Even as a Christian, and we lose sight of that, there's no joy. God is most glorified. He's most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. When you most trust in him. When you most submit to him. When you take joy in him. Guys, I had four weeks uh, on a sermon, a series on idolatry. And there, there's, I think, so much more to have been said like even just our wholeheartedness. And, um, uh, but that's it. Uh, that's, that, that's it, really. It's the question, how do God's children deal with temptations in our uh, the temptations of idols? How, how do believers battle idolatry in our hearts? How do followers of Christ live lives of pleasing worship rather than lives of idolatry? Well, when you're tempted to take your eyes off of God, and you're tempted to worship anything in the place of God. And you're tempted to cling to anything other than God in this life for ultimate security. When you're in danger of becoming like what you worship, becoming more like idols than conformed to Christ. When you're in danger of belittling God's glory and His holiness, and you're tempted to direct your all away from God. You're tempted to think that God is not enough tempted to grumble toward God and not be grateful, you must wage war against idolatry. You must fix your eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of your faith. You must pursue joy in the Lord. You must stand before God, plead with Him, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. You need to delight yourself in the Lord. And we are to battle idolatry 
through communion, namely through prayer, because prayer is worship. Prayer is submission. Prayer is trust. Prayer is dependence on Him to protect you. Prayer is alignment to His forgiving character. You want to battle idolatry in your heart. Our Lord said, pray then like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let's pray together as we, and prepare ourselves for communion.